Hello, beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more about what I do at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you rest. For those of you who have been listening for a while, you know that I am someone who also listens to sleep podcasts. You know, when I got the inspiration to start this podcast nine months ago, I just looked at my stats. It's been nine months. Can you believe it? And this is my 78th episode. And I really just followed my heart. I co-create with sparks of inspiration, and I knew that I wanted to do a sleep podcast because I have found them to be so valuable, and I thought it would be a fun creative outlet. And then I also recognized that if I were to do a sleep podcast, of course it would have to include angels, because everything I do includes angels. And what I hadn't contemplated was who would wind up listening (laughs) because people who use sleep podcasts may not be used to angels and my audience, which is expecting all things angels, may not be interested in a sleep podcast and none of that occurred to me. Thank goodness. (laughs) I'm so glad that When I co-create, I I really am very impractical because I just follow the lines of energy that delight me. And so I created the podcast I would want to listen to. And you know what is so cool? There are those of you that want to listen (laughs) to. We have a small but mighty audience at this point. And it feels very intimate. And I am so appreciative of the opportunity to get to spend time with you. I find listening to podcasts to be a very intimate experience, especially sleep podcasts. I put in my earbuds and I pull the blankets over my head. (laughs) I sleep like a turtle. Um, I pull the blankets over my head with my earbuds in and then someone's voice lulls me to sleep. It is the sweetest thing (laughs) and it is truly a blessing to get to show up and do this for you too. So I invite you to get comfortable and cozy in whatever way works best for you. Plump up your pillows just so. Pull the blanket up just as far as you want it to go. And let your body know it has permission to grow heavy and relax. And I invite you to take some nice deep breaths in and release. You have done enough for today. And you are worthy of a good expanse of rest. 
And the angels are already here, but I love the ritual of calling them in so that you know they are here as well. So I'm going to ask them to join us now. Beautiful angels on high, I ask that you join us here. And I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves upon waves of love for each of our beloveds gathered here now. I ask that you bring forward comforting, soothing energies compatible with good rest. And I ask that you clear away anything that is not ours. You clear away anything that feels stressful any of our fears or doubts or worries, just clear them away to help us gain altitude and connect with divine grace. And dear one, just take a nice big deep breath in. You are coming into an intentional energy field that is being cultivated just for you. That even if there are many people listening to this broadcast right now, the angels are specifically with you. And they are helping to co-create an energy field that will be supportive for you. So if anything is feeling burdensome, if you are worried, just breathe that out and the angels will gather it up and help transmute these frequencies for you. I find that there is something so healing about coming into the higher energy fields. because they give us altitude. It's always so interesting to me that that which I thought was so heavy and difficult somehow dissipates. Not everything, of course. Life can be very, very hard sometimes. And when I talk about energies dissipating, that feel burdensome and worrisome, more often than not, I'm referring to the mundane pedestrian stressors of life. Certainly, if you are going through something very profound and difficult, it is not expected that all of a sudden you will feel bright and shiny in this moment. But what we will do is sit with you and let you know that you are loved. And these energies of love and light also will bring to you comfort. So just take a breath in and release. I love to use the time right before sleep to ask the angels for help. I might ask them to help me acclimate to a more brighter sense of spirit, lightness of spirit, I love to call it. I might ask them to help me clear or heal something that's up for me. I love to ask them for sparks of inspiration. I'm not consciously strategic when it comes to my business. Those of you who've been with me for a long time will know this to be true. And an example would be, I have no idea, I mean a little bit of an idea, but 
I don't have my schedule worked out for September. I, I don't know what I'm going to be offering exactly. I once attended a wonderful social media training with a woman who I, I think is phenomenal at what she teaches, and I got a lot of value out of it. And one of the things she shared was that she plans her editorial calendar out a year in advance. And I gasped. I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine doing that. I don't know what I want to offer or write about next Thursday, much less a year from now. So I really love this way of co-creating with the angels. It allows me to connect with the energies that are swirling about as well as my own energy. And then I have a sense on where to go. And so I feel confident that come September, which as I record this is about two weeks away, that I will know what I'm offering. I will know how I want to show up in the world. It's a very organic way of living. So it might be completely confounding and maddening for some people. But for me, it allows me to embrace the spontaneity of my spirit. I don't feel burdened or beholden to tomorrow. I get to be in this moment more fully. How many of you are old enough to remember the series The Flying Nun with Sally Field? This may have just been a show that was um, aired in the United States, so if you're listening abroad, <laughs> you might not know about this show, but the show was about an order of nuns, and Sally Field was this young and enthusiastic nun, and the habit that they wore had these caps that had almost wings on them, they weren't really meant to be wings, but it was sort of an origami kind of cap. And the show's premise was that they were aerodynamic in a way that Sally Fields could fly <laughs> with her nun's habit on. It, it was a crazy premise, but it worked because it was, you know, the 60s or 70s, whenever it was, and we were easily entertained. And her character would wet her finger. She would put her finger in her mouth and wet her finger. And she would hold it up to the breeze to see which way the breeze was blowing. And then she would leap. <laughs> Very iconic. And that's what I feel like my co-creation style is. <laughs> it's the flying nun theory of life. You, you you tune in to which way the breeze is blowing and where you are most aerodynamically inclined to succeed. And then you leap. A little, a little bit of spiritual wisdom blended with iconic classic television, which is so typically me. <laughs> My life is based upon TV shows, food, angels, <laughs> and, um, and a little bit of fairy dust sprinkled in there. So I, I don't know that this strategy works well for anybody else, but it is how I live my life. I don't know how I got into this ramble here. I know we were talking about the angels helping us lift our energy fields up to help clear away, and then I was talking to you about how I love to use the time before I sleep to come into brighter frequencies, and now I have shared with you my secret sauce of the flying nun <laughs> strategy for co-creation. It'll be our secret. I share it with you in confidence. <laughs> Shh. 
don't tell other people. Because <laughs> who knows what the world could become if we all made like the flying nun and followed the breezes of our knowingness and our authentic spirit. It could be utter chaos. Not that it's not already chaos, but you know, it'll be our little secret. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm sorry. I guess I must be a little punchy. I did not know this about myself in this moment until I started talking to you. Well, some giggles are so good before bedtime. It reminds me of slumber parties or when someone would sleep over and we would just giggle over the silliest things because we were so tired and, you know, when you're, you're overtired and everything is funny. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> I think everything is funny and absurd and awesome all at the same time. So I'm whispering to you from underneath the blanket fort. If you're new to the podcast, I have this big fluffy blanket that I throw over my computer monitor and I create a little blanket fort or cave because it helps dampen the sound and it delights me. So here we are. I'm in my blanket fort and hopefully you're all cozied up and the angels are here helping to lighten up your spirit, brighten up your light and bring you lots and lots of love. Because in moments like this, I remember that this world is a beautiful place. And yes, I know the greater experience right now is feeling a lot like chaos and challenge, but there's also beautiful moments. There's hummingbirds that fly by and hover outside our windows. And here in the U.S., it's summer and we have stone fruit, which means peaches and nectarines and melons, which aren't stone fruit. They are their own thing, but you get it. You get where I'm going. Like this world is a beautiful place. The skies are blue. We get to have our fur babies who love us. We get to watch sunsets. We get to read books that take us off on adventures. And I have to say, I have been enchanted if anyone is looking for a good book. <laughs> and this is not a spiritual book. This is a fiction, book of fiction. The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. Oh my God, what a beautiful book. So if you're looking for a good read, that book has stayed with me. It's about the pack horse librarians from the 20s and 30s in the hills of Kentucky who would deliver books to the people who were living in very rural areas of the mountains. And it's just stayed with me in such a beautiful way. So here's to good book. See, the world is a beautiful place. It also is a dumpster fire. But you know, some days we choose that the glass is half full. I'm a half full kind of girl most days. So here's to the beautiful world we live in. Here's to delicious nectarines. Here's to somehow picking out the perfect watermelon, which is not easy. I am a terrible watermelon picker. I have watched all of the videos on how to pick a watermelon and I still don't pick a good one, but I'm affirming I'm going to get the perfect watermelon soon that you will too. 
So in the meanwhile, I will continue rambling and keeping you company. And the angels are here bringing you love. And I'm going to read and ramble to you some more. So cozy on up and snuggle on in. And give yourself permission to drift off. I promise not to say anything too important. And the angels will be watching over you and wrapping you in a beautiful bubble of light. So you rest well. And I'm going to read and ramble (laughs) and share the delight with you. So I thought we could return to an issue of Country Life in America. This was a magazine that was published in the early 1900s. And I just find it fascinating. Some of the areas are now more urban here in 2022, but back in 1903, they were considered the country. And I'm always fascinated by how expansive these estates were. So we're going to ramble, we're going to wander through. This is Country Life in America, a magazine for the homemaker, the vacation seeker, the gardener, the farmer, the nature teacher, the naturalist. And this is volume four, May to October 1903, published by Doubleday, Page, and Company. Okay, so if we could time travel back to 1903, we could purchase 1,100 acres in New Hampshire for sale to close an estate. This property is located in Antrim, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, A-N-T-R-I-M, one of the most beautiful towns in southern New Hampshire. It is only 75 miles from Boston and 20 miles from Dublin. The buildings are set in the center of the estate on a gentle slope surrounded by high hills and includes a house, 24 feet by 36 feet, of eight rooms, with piazza, two barns, one small and the other very large, all in excellent condition. The cleared lands comprise fields, meadows, and high mountain pastures, and aggregate 300 acres. The sod is strong and fertile, pure water, elevation about 1,200 feet. The place is reached by a four-mile drive from the railroad station over a very good road. This is an exceptional opportunity to secure a large acreage, unusually well adapted, on account of its natural advantages, for private game, park, or club purposes, as well as for stock raising. A lake two mile long is within the ten-minute ride of the buildings. The price is $9,000. Like we could pool our money together and get 1,100 acres in New Hampshire. Just if one of you does, though, develop the time travel machine, let me know. (laughs) You can go. Here's one. It says, for an artist or retired gentleman, Highland Wild, and that's in quotes, Highland Wild in the heart of the highlands of the Hudson. I don't know where that is. A massively built old-style granite mansion situated in the center of grounds consisting of 26 acres sloping down to the Hudson River between Peekskill and Highlands, having a river frontage of several hundred feet. The views up and down the river are unsurpassed, the one above being taken of a part of the grounds in front of the house. Title guaranteed. Price $12,000. Might consider taking other useful property in part to payment. That sounds lovely. 
Here's a southern estate, 600 acres, one mile from county seat, 30-room house, modern improvements, spring water at all buildings, fine shade tree, 10 acres of lawn, manager's house, 8 rooms, a stable, up-to-date cattle barn with basement, storage barn, tenements, wagon, and tool sheds, soil red and gray, loams, I guess, L-O-A-M-S, clay subsoil, high state of cultivation, 100 acres and small grains, same in corn, 10 small grazing lots with running water, pasture, and 8 shifts average, 30 acres each. And the location is Piedmont Foothills, 140 miles west from Norfolk, 14 hours all rail to New York. And it's going to be $75 an acre. So we can get a small farm if we would like to go. Okay, and then there is, there is an ad for Agate Nickel Steelware. And this is a headline. This is, this is in a large font. So it's the first thing you see. It says, no poison. <laughs> and I don't know what that says about what they're selling, but that that's the headline, no poison. And then in little letters it says, has ever been found in the enamel of agate nickel steelware. So it's for kitchen utensils. And I just, I just think it's in terms of a copywriter that that has to be your headline. No poison. Oh, good. (laughs) That's a relief. I don't know what was happening in that time in terms of enamel that people were cooking in, but apparently that was an issue. There is an ad at Yale University for a summer school of forestry. So if you'd like to learn to be a forester, I don't know, would you be a forester at that point? There is the Bordentown Military Institute. Every influence tends to lead a boy to form habits of right living, which shall be the foundation of an upright and noble manhood. Every boy is urged to aim at a definite goal and to work hard for success. Three courses are offered, scientific, classical, English, college preparatory. So that's the Bordentown Military Institute. Oh, I'm so glad that I never had to go to something like that. I would not have, I would not have flourished. Okay, and now we come to an article, which was one of the reasons I picked this issue, because I thought it might be fun to read together, or interesting at least. It's A Camping Vacation, How Three Women Camped for a Month at a Cost of Less Than $11 for Each Person, by Katherine Chandler. I just thought this would be fun to read together. And I should also tell you, I am not a camper person. I am a fluffy bed hotel person, which if you know me will be no surprise to you. But we can at least travel with these lovely women to hear how their trip went. So here we go. When we had once decided that Yosemite was to be our summer relaxation, we began investigating to find which method of visiting the valley could squeeze the greatest number of days out of our ill-stored wallets. We learned that the lowest rate at the hotel was $3 a day. This, in addition to the traveling expenses, meant too short a stay for us to attempt the trip. A 10 days excursion to a camp hotel was advertised with the entire cost $48 a person, but it would give us only seven days in the valley, and we all agreed that we wanted more. If we could drive, we could get a team and camp en route, and while there, and we were assured that this method would give us a month in Yosemite with a total expense of $25 each. Unfortunately, none of us knew anything about horses, and so this way could not be considered. So again, this was the time before cars were readily available. So when they say drive, I think they meant 
getting horses. I think, I guess. Okay, we'll keep going though. <laughs> Pursuing the subject of camping, we learned that we could rent tents and furnishings from the storekeeper in the valley and buy provisions there on so reasonable terms that we could easily remain a whole month. We had never camped before, but we welcomed the opportunity to learn how. Our inquiry to the storekeeper brought forth the estimate that the three of us could get a tent, furnishings, and provisions for a total of $10 per week. We immediately engaged one tent, three cots, and household paraphernalia to be ready on our arrival. This was fortunate as the supply of tents is not equal to the demand for them. We brought our tickets in over one line, paying an extra charge for return by a different route. On all the roads, each person's baggage is limited to 50 pounds, so we planned carefully to carry only what we would need. We took our own bedding and household linen, though linen is too polite a name to apply to our furnishings. Our sheets were dark-colored cotton, our tablecloth was white oilcloth, and our dish towels were of brownie flannelette. Only our personal towels were of the conventional character. Our clothes, too, were adapted to the needs of camping in the mountains. We each had one pair of tramping shoes with hobnails in the soles and heels and a lighter pair for resting in the camp. In addition to our traveling suits and the women who wore linen was the best fortified against the dust, we each had a warm wrap for evenings, two short skirts, one denim and one woolen, a sunbonnet and a canvas hat, a pair of canvas leggings, and several shirtwaists of flannelette and cotton crepe, which did not need start. In camping, no matter how favorable the situation, one gets surprisingly dirty, and so we had a goodly supply of underwear and towels. These we washed ourselves every evening when retiring. The valley water is so soft and cleansing that one can easily laundry unstarched clothes. Laundering out is expensive, as labor has to come so far to serve. When we reached the valley, our tent was ready, pitched beneath Glacier Point, facing the beautiful half-dome. Two cots were placed in it. The third for the woman who loved the stars was installed under an oaken filigree. The kitchen and dining room were in a group of young pines. We had thought one tent would be sufficient, but when the intermittent showers of the first two days evolved into a genuine mountain storm on the third, we decided to rent a smaller tent to keep the salt and sugar intact. This was afterwards found to be unnecessary, as no other shower occurred during the month. The smaller tent was used as a dining room with the stove just outside the entrance so that it could be easily moved in if a downpour threatened. The table was in the center and the camp chairs were brought in at mealtimes. Some empty boxes were fashioned into two cupboards in the back of the dining room. Another formed a kitchen table out by the stove. This stove was a Klondiker, a sheet iron, cylindrical, capable of being telescoped and light enough to be easily carried. Its resemblance to a locomotive without wheels furnished materials for jokes, but its cooking qualities gave eminent satisfaction. The mathematician kept an itemized account of our expenses, and her report on return to San Francisco showed the bill for the camping outfit to be $13.95, for food, $18.15, and for traveling expenses, $124.05, making a total of $156.15, or $52.05 each. Deducting the cost of transportation to and from the Yosemite, our expenses in the park were less than $11 each. 
The food amounts to a ridiculously small figure for a month. Yet two of us had very healthy appetites and we frequently entertained guests. The food was all nourishing and we had sufficient variety not to get weary of one article. Fresh meats we could get only once and fresh vegetables and fruits only twice a week. And then the article abruptly ends, so that's where all we're going to know about their trip to Yosemite, but it sounds lovely, a month in Yosemite, um, although I would not want to camp for a month, but the Yosemite part sounds delightful. And now we're going to move on to another article, How to Travel by Sea by Lawrence Perry. The phrase floating hotel has been applied so often to transatlantic greyhounds in the past few years that the general public, or at least that part of it which has never traveled by ocean, doubtless regard it as merely a term. Of course they realize that if they book a passage for Europe, they are going to be made very comfortable and all that. But nevertheless, a full appreciation of what modern shipbuilding has accomplished in the way of conveniences, comforts, and luxuries, to say nothing of the necessities of life, must come by practical experience. It is the same as in railroad travel. One does not quite grasp what he has heard or read until he himself takes the limited train and a dash across the continent or even to Chicago. Perhaps for the first time you have caught the fever and have decided to go abroad this season. You have applied at the office of the steamship line you favor and have received your berth or stateroom or suite, as may be the case. Your baggage has been checked direct from the ferry or the railroad station to the pier, and willing porters have carried that portion of it, which you have marked cabin, to your stateroom and the remaining luggage which you will not need on the trip to the baggage room. Access to this room may be obtained at a certain hour each day. You are ready now to apply to the second steward for a seat at one of the tables in the dining room saloon, as it is called. Having done so, you begin to look about you. Perhaps you have a suite of rooms, two bedrooms, a sitting room, and the bath. All the rooms are big and airy and wholesome and fresh, with walls and ceilings tastefully painted, and the furniture usually consisting of some dark hardwood. Large portholes open out on deck, and the rooms are fitted with sofas, tables, chairs, wardrobes, and beds, the last of which look as though they could cure insomnia. There are electric lights throughout, and in fact all the conveniences that progress has brought forth. Single staterooms are no less elaborate so far as furnishings and conveniences are concerned. If you go more cheaply booking in a cabin, which you share with three others, the berth space necessarily prohibits the elaborate furnishings of the single rooms and suites, but you are very comfortable just the same. After the process of settling down and unpacking is over, you are ready to enjoy the voyage. This aforesaid process should consume a good portion of the first day out, so tomorrow morning, then, you begin to fall well into the life of shipboard. In the first place, assuming that you have a room with no bath, the bathroom steward will come around at the morning hour which you have designated to him and inform you that your salt water tub, hot or cold, as you please, is awaiting you. Say this is about half hour after seven. Refreshed by the bath, you walk along to the saloon and are served with a cup of coffee, and you are also served a roll, after which you repair to the deck for a before-breakfast constitutional. Soon the bugle summons you to breakfast in the saloon, The saloon is the largest apartment in the ship and without a doubt the pleasantest. No expense has been spared in decorative effects of magnificent and artistic merit that would take a page to adequately describe. Many passengers, by the way, prefer to breakfast in their cabins. 
After breakfast, having visited the library with its stock of a thousand books, including works historical, classical, and the latest fiction, you repair to the deck, followed by your cabin steward with a pile of rugs and other wraps. Here you lounge in your steamer chair until 11 o'clock when the deck stewards pass crackers and chicken broth or some other light refreshments. Then come deck games, such as quoits, billiards, and hopscotch, until luncheon is served. After that, there is afternoon tea, and finally dinner. Having communication with two and perhaps three countries, the ship's cuisine is not second to that of a best hotel in the land. With fruits from California, picked oysters from Baltimore, beef from Chicago, and New York mutton from Berkshire, chickens from the Dorking Farms, and the finest supplies of Paris, London, and Berlin, one loses nothing from being on shipboard. After meals, most of the men go to the smoking room, and the decoration and furnishing of which the various steamship companies spare no pains or expense. There are fine paintings on the walls, groups of cozy seats and tables where a little game sometimes assumes very large proportions, perfect ventilation, chess tables and checkerboards, a very excellent, albeit hidden bar, and a line of smokers' materials that would fit out a small tobacco store. Many spend most of their time here, but perhaps you prefer the library with its cozy corners and comfortable seats and numerous desks with shaded lights, where you may write up your journal or catch up in the latest fiction or the magazines of two continents. You will find it pleasant above in the music room, where there are pianos and organs and sheet music galore. There are also barber shops, gymnasium, a drug department, two physicians, a band, and whatnot. Briefly, there is everything that you could desire, everything that a hotel could furnish save buses to points of interest. But then does not the view from the deck compensate for all of this? Now comes a school of porpoises. Now a whale blows in the distance. Now a sodden derelict or an iceberg drifts by. There are no dull days. Second cabin accommodations in their way are as complete and perfect as those of the first saloon. Things are on a cheaper scale, that is all. There are the saloon and the music room, the library and smoking room. Smaller and less ornate than those of the first cabin, it is true, yet essentially comfortable and pleasant. The stewards are attendant, obliging, the staterooms large and well furnished, and the provisions as best that can be brought. A portion of the upper deck is also allotted to the second saloon. Everything is as good as it is in the first cabin, only simpler. The superfluities are left out. Now, how much will it cost to make the trip abroad, you may ask? Well, here are some figures, which perhaps will serve as a basis for reckoning. The minimum price now at which you may obtain passage on boats of the Deutschland type is $110, for which you may have a berth in the first saloon in a stateroom occupied by three others, or under the same conditions you may purchase passage on the finest boats of the Cunard, American, and White Star Lines for $100. If you desire to go more cheaply, you may book on steamship rates as third class, like the Eturia and Umbria, for $80. On the Atlantic transport line and the big German combination boats, you may obtain first cabin passage at even more reasonable rates, but not much more. All this, of course, applies to the first cabin in one direction. There is but slight reduction for excursion passage, off on the price of the return ticket. Persons may cross for less money by booking in the second cabin. In any other season but the present one, rather a mixed crowd travels in the department, 
but now you are sure to meet very congenial and agreeable lists of passengers there. Berths may be obtained in this department on all steamships, from fifty dollars upward. You may obtain a stateroom containing four berths, all to yourself here, at one hundred and fifty dollars. In the first saloon, you pay from three hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars for a stateroom, and seven hundred to twelve hundred dollars for a suite. Having booked on one of the transatlantic liners, you would do well to provide yourself with a letter of credit issued by some well-established banking firm, and also with sufficient cash, including small change, in the currency of the country in which you intend to disembark. Pursers on steamships, however, accept money of any country in payment of bills incurred on shipboard. Steamships allow your baggage to the extent of two small steamer trunks, but the connecting lines abroad are not so liberal, charging heavy access for all baggage over 60 or 100 pounds. The best way to avoid expense is to leave the main part of the luggage at London or some other central point in travel light. Most of the continental railroads allow you from 57 to 100 pounds of baggage. Shirts, underwear, collars, cuffs, and the like may be purchased cheaply en route, so too much space need not be given up to such things. On shipboard, soft hats and rubber-soled shoes for men, and tam o shanters I don't know what those are, tam o shanters and veils for the women will be found very convenient. And then it looks like this section, um, they're advertising different destinations, just giving a sense on how long it takes you to get there and what you can expect. So this is called the far west. So there's there's just little snippets, but it gives you a sense on how long it took to travel to these places. So we start off with Colorado Springs, Colorado, 24 hours from St. Louis, 12 hours from Kansas City, famous resort at the base of Pikes Peak, beautiful scenery, dry, clean air, Healing Springs, noted for fashionable society. Whenever I see something like that that says fashionable society, exclusive, I know that they're not talking about me. (laughs) Um, I would be one of the ordinary people. I would not be considered fashionable. Um, We'll continue, though. Bunwood Springs, Colorado, 11 hours from Denver, surrounded by mountains, well-known health resort. In the open-air pool, one may bathe comfortably with snow falling. Salt Lake City, 27 hours from Denver, one of the most progressive communities in America. Beautiful city with many points of interest. Great Salt Lake is 20 minutes from the city. Austin, Texas, about 18 hours from New Orleans. 48 hours from Chicago, the capital city of Texas. Dry, agreeable air makes it a much sought resort. El Paso, Texas, situated in the lower Rio Grande Valley, popular with lovers of a sunny climate. Rugged mountain scenery, the best of hotels. French Lick Springs, Indiana. Medicinal springs situated in a beautiful valley, the chief attraction. Also, every facility for indoor and outdoor amusement. San Francisco, California. The beautiful gateway to the Pacific. Most interesting in its cosmopolitan character. Famous Chinatown, the city within a city. It is a treasure house of the picturesque. Mount Tamalpais, California, 10 miles from San Francisco, overlooking the city and affording a wonderful view of the Golden Gate and surrounding valleys and mountains. Monterey, California, a paradise of flowers and sunshine, a justly popular resort, attracting visitors from all over the world. 
fine hotels. Santa Cruz, California, north side of the Bay of Monterey. All the advantages offered by the California shore. Nearby is a grove of the wonderful big trees. They're talking about the sequoias, one of the sites of California. The Yosemite, California. State parks enclosed in perpendicular walls two to 3,000 feet high. Level valley covered with vegetation. Grand beauty of the valley and falls make it a long-to-be-remembered site. Mariposa Grove in Calaveras Grove, California. Here are the big trees, the famous redwoods of California. Like pillars in a mighty cathedral they stand. Their age is from 1,500 to 2,000 years, and some are 125 feet in circumference. Los Angeles, California. A very beautiful city with handsome hotels and residences. The whole city is a very garden of bloom, social and commercial center of Southern California. Pasadena, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, a famous resort of Eastern families. Redondo Beach in Santa Monica, California, two popular beaches near Los Angeles, splendid hotels, excellent bathing. Santa Catalina Island, California, 30 miles off the coast, delightful, invigorating air, first-class hotel, many visitors, bathing, yachting, and fishing, and it keeps going. It also includes Santa Barbara, San Diego, Coronado, and Hawaii. I just think that's interesting as they are talking about the different places you might want to travel and how they describe them. And then there are also lots of articles about gardening. And it must be the time of year, but these issues have a lot of articles about how to grow strawberries. There is no department of horticulture more interesting or more profitable when the work is done intelligently and the weather conditions are not unfavorable than the raising of strawberries. I have grown this fruit for the market for more than 30 years, and although I feel that I still have much to learn, my experience may be of some value to persons just beginning this work or thinking of undertaking it. When I began raising strawberries, scarcely any effort had been made to improve the fruit and increase its size. Cultivated berries were hardly larger than wild ones growing in a favorable location. But this soon changed. The first step in the process of evolution which has produced the modern strawberry was the introduction of the Wilson, which was hailed as a great improvement over all other varieties, and indeed it was an improvement. This was followed in a few years by the crescent, more prolific, but still leaving much to be desired in the way of its flavor and size. Then came the introduction of the sharpless, and for a time almost everyone thought the acme of strawberry perfection had been reached, but the sharpless, although large, was very rough and irregular in shape, and the experimenters and breeders of new plants would not rest until a variety had been produced combining large size and shapeliness, the two things most needed in a berry that was to obtain the favor of the public and supplant the other varieties known at that time. In the last few years, these points have both been gained and there now exist several varieties of strawberries adapted to different kinds of soil, each of which, in its proper environment, will produce large crops of big round berries, as different from the Wilson of almost 40 years ago, as is the Baldwin apple from the wild crab. A variety of strawberries which in one locality or on one kind of soil surpasses all others may be worthless in another section. The Parker Earl, which in many parts of the country has been a truly wonderful berry, 
has never done anything on my place, either in size, quality, or productiveness, while the Nick Omer, which on my ground has been a great success, is said not to do well on the prairie soil of the Midwest, where Parker Earl is at its best. On my soil, which runs from a gravelly loam to a heavy clay, Wilson, Crescent, Sharpless, and Bubok, in their turn, have all done well. Marshall produced fine fruit, but not in a very great abundance. Brandywine was indifferently good, and Parker Earl, Mary, and Gandy were failures. I mention these varieties because they are well known over a wide scope of country and have done well in many localities, but the list is endless. For the past few years, my main crop berries have been Nick Omer and two seedlings of my own, which I call number three, and Amwell. Number three has now been discarded as worn out, but the Amwell I still keep. One really interested in strawberry growing will find great pleasure and perhaps sometimes originate a valuable new variety by sowing a little seed in a box every year and testing for a season or two the plants he obtains from it. Most of them are worthless. Most of those which promise well the first year of bearing deteriorate into worthlessness by the second. But occasionally a new type of real value may be found. Just now I am planting large quantities of seedlings, which I originated in this way, in which four years of careful testing have shown to be better fitted to my soil and location than any other variety. This variety has done so well for me that I offered the plants for sale last summer, something I'd never ventured to do with a seedling before. I fruit every year from two to three acres of strawberries. The cost of planting and caring for an acre for one year is about 105 or $110. A considerable part of this expense with me arises from fighting the chickweed, which blossoms and goes to seed an incredibly short time, and must be fought during eight months of the year. In localities not infested with this or any other very foul weed, the expenditure would be considerably lessened. I find it so interesting to hear him writing about the different varieties. You know, um, our produce these days have really has really become homogenized. There's a wonderful store here in Berkeley called Berkeley Bowl. And Berkeley Bowl has an immense variety of produce. So whatever's in season, they might have 10 varieties of it. So pluots, 10 different kinds, 10 different kinds of nectarines, 10 different kinds of apples. And I have really discovered some delicious varieties of fruit that I wasn't aware of before. And so here's to all of our farmers and all of those who tend to heirloom varieties and and those who help our palates experience delightfulness in the flavors we get to consume. So that was our rambling through the 1903 volume for A Country Life. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're asleep. If you're not, you can queue up another episode. There are lots of them in the archive. And for now, my beautiful friend, I wish you sweet dreams. I wish you a good rest. I am so deeply grateful for you. You are precious in all of this world, and I am grateful to know you. We'll talk again soon. Thank you so much. Be well. Good night.